Dr. Dara here, Truth with Dr. Dara, and you are in my kitchen. That's it, because today we're talking about uh, your relationship with food, women's relationship with food, and feeding your soul. So I'm on Instagram Live down here and Facebook. If you guys have any questions, go ahead and put it in the bottom. I see a couple of you are already joining on. And so I figured what better place to talk about food but in the kitchen because so much happens in here and I feel like so many times people are cooking and eating and when they're doing it they're paying no attention to what they're doing they're too preoccupied so if you guys um, are like me when I'm in the kitchen I am all over the place and it's very easy to start like putting food in your mouth and the, before you know it there's abundancy going on or you're not hungry <laughs> so that is what we're gonna talk about the nitty-gritty how did it happen if you're fueling your body if you're fueling your mind and most of all if you're fueling your soul like in here in your gut so I see Kirsten you're on here lovely Lucille and Jacqueline and Lou good to have you guys and there's a bunch of you who already jumped on over here in Instagram so again if you have any questions put them here in the box and welcome welcome to my kitchen so what's going on with you guys do you feel like what you eat fuels your soul do you feel like you are what you eat do you feel like there's been patterns that have started from years ago that have created your ideas around food you know I think about this little girl who might have gotten a cookie when she was five years old and from the very beginning you get this idea around food because if you're five years old and you're given a cookie a couple of things go on you might think hmm I love this cookie and you it makes you feel good and warm and fuzzy inside so automatically your brain is connecting that it's a sense of pleasure and then another thing might go on with the food you might notice that you get a lot of attention around food like hey Dara you want another cookie you want another cookie and and the more that you say yes, the more attention that you get. And I don't know, in my family, that was kind of a thing. Like always making sure that you're fed enough and you get enough food. So does that happen for you? Because it also creates ideas around being a bad girl. Because if you get given the cookie and they go, ah, you shouldn't be eating that. Don't eat any more cookies. And right away, that little tiny person is thinking, oh no, if I eat a cookie, that makes me naughty or bad, so I'm going to say no. And then the next thing you know, you look behind the closet and there's a little girl over there like stuffing it in her mouth. Or I know there was an ongoing joke in our house that there's half-eaten chocolates. Well, I will still never confirm or deny who they were. I always just blamed them on my brother. But it is has a lot to do with the way things start to connect for us in our head from when we're a very young age. A bunch more of you are jumping on. Brian, I see you're on there. Kirsten says, howdy. I guess that's what you, you say up in Virginia. And we're talking about relationships with food. We're talking about how it affects people. And does it affect men differently than it affects women? You know, is there a stigma around that? And how it relates to mental health? Because uh, maybe a lot of you saw that this week, or is it last week? It was National Eating Disorder Awareness week and I shared my story. I hadn't really been public with that before because you don't walk around on your forehead saying something like, hey, I um, I had an eating disorder because oftentimes people will think that's just weird or they give it a stigma or it's something that um, doesn't feel so great. But there's a lot of the weaving that goes on ingrained in our head from a really young age around food. Um, Christine says, I love cooking and feeding people. And even with that, I don't know how many others of you like to cook. I know that years ago, I was all about food and food was like a sign, like I said, of, of happiness, but I don't love cooking so much anymore. It makes me feel very overwhelmed. And for many years, I would try to be the hostess with the mostess and I would cook food. But like, do you like doing it? Do you not like doing it? Debbie says, such a love-hate relationship for me with food, right? And um, Jacqueline says, I hosted a watch party, great topic, and it's the Le it's Lent season, so excited. <laughs> That's awesome, Jacqueline. Yeah, so like the idea around food and festivities often happens and women create this too. I mean, there's still that stigma that there's females serving food and in the kitchen and making it and you're serving it and it has to look pretty and when are you supposed to eat it? I mean, I'm sure a lot of you, when you're cooking it, you don't even eat anything and then you find yourself starving yourself. 
So the idea around foods, whether it's been ingrained in your head from a young age or it's something that's going on for you now, is it is completely rewirable. Think of it if you were I don't know, when we moved in our house, in our kitchen, it was wired all crazy. And you'd go to turn the light switch on and it would turn on the light in a different area. And when that would be going on, it was the wiring needed to be rerouted. That is what we can do with our heads. And by doing that, then you're gonna have a different association because when you had that cookie when you were five years old, there was an emotional connection. Some kind of emotional connection was created. So the same way it was created, we can uncreate it. So we can talk about different ideas of how to dismantle those connections. Lauren saying, hi, Penny, I see that you just got on. Welcome guys. So how do you dismantle it? Well, first and foremost, you want to make sure that the kitchen is a place of relaxation, not a place of tension. I could listen to myself because I find I come in here and then right behind me would usually be where I plug in my um, phone or my computer. And then right over here to my left is my stove. And the next thing you know, I'm doing a hundred things at a time and I'm not being present at all. And then by the time I get to the table, I'm completely flustered and I'm not even tasting or paying attention to what I'm eating and how does that correlate with some of the things that you're doing like when you were a kid well I mean did you sit down and eat when you were a kid or were you taught that you just ate um, on the run or did you eat dessert was dessert like this big huge thing that it was like if you finished everything on your plate then you can eat was food a reward. I see that now with kids and I have a confession, it makes me a little crazy. Um, my daughter was in soccer and the soccer coach said, um, well, we're just gonna, well, he didn't say it, he didn't even ask. He just started giving out a piece of candy to all the kids at the end of soccer. And I'm thinking to myself, this is such a great um, time for them to get to play and have fun. Why do we have to connect it with reward of food? And they said, well, we've been doing it like this for a long time and um, we can't, we can't change it. You know, the kids, some of the kids really want to do it and some of the kids really do it for the food. And I'm just thinking to myself, well, I mean, if you're going to give them food, could it be an orange or why not a sticker? Because kids will work pretty hard for that and if not they're going to start to associate that that hard work in them playing soccer is around the food. I mean even you go to the pediatrician's office and they're offering them a lollipop for getting a shot and I'm thinking to myself I don't really want to and I'm trying to like cut it off at the end. I mean I don't know what your thoughts are but offering a reward maybe a little toy or some sticker would definitely be more advantageous because then that that's where it's going to get ingrained. If I do something or if I do something I don't like, I get that food as a reward. So I'm thinking for a lot of you, there's some bells ringing right now. There's definitely some bells ringing because you're starting to think back of, oh, well, this happened when I was a kid. Well, the same thing's going on because um, a lot of times people are in the kitchen, like I said, and you're not present and you're picking. And then there's this whole idea around guilt. So it's not even what you're eating, but it's around what you're, um, you're thinking about what you're eating. Lou says, I think the two connection are eating for a purpose or eating out of pleasure. Yeah, exactly, Lou. And, but is it about pleasure? I worked with this nutritionist that's fabulous and uh, some of you may know her, uh, Nikki Glantz, and she would say, um, do you love your food? This idea that it's like this romantic relationship around the food, it gets a little bit intense. And a lot of times families sit around and there is such a big fuss around the food but somebody eats and their eyes like brighten up like it's this orgasmic experience when food is on the table and I get that that's something that we like and it's pleasurable and for some people it's completely fine but for other people it's problematic because they cannot even be present and everything is all in you know um, that's where you start to deviate the differences between eating disorder and disordered eating and just a brief like what is the difference well eating disorders are when it's consuming your life and you can no longer do the things that you want to be doing you can't get to work because you're completely thinking about food and just uh, that's when there's just all kinds of emotional connections that start uh, Debbie says food was given as a comfort in my childhood upset have a cookie exactly exactly and I see Lauren says that drives me nuts my kids daycare would give out candy if they listened I had to ask them to not to not do it right and um, 
good for you, Lauren, for talking with them because I did not have a positive experience with this soccer coach. Um, he said that they weren't gonna stop doing it. And at the end of the day, I had to make a decision. Either I tell my daughter she can't play soccer. Why can't she play soccer? Because she can't have a piece of candy or, and she enjoyed it, or um, they, or like here's a piece of candy. So I kind of went with the flow on that one. Um, I can't win them all, right? Uh, Lucille says toys or stickers are so much better for kids as a reward. Yeah, well, I've got news for you guys. So are they for adults, <laughs> right? We do that all the time. We say, oh, well, how can I reward myself? I mean, how do we celebrate? How do we celebrate? So much of the time our celebration is around food. Um, if something happens and it's exciting it's like all right let's go out to eat um even birthdays we celebrate with food and we celebrate with cake and then um i mean can you tell me something we don't celebrate with food i just wonder what that would be like i literally had a young girl in my office and she noticed that food had gotten to be too much of a preoccupation for her and at least she recognized that it is um problematic but she was so concerned because if she were to tell her boyfriend that she was she didn't know what they would do together because they go out to dinner and they do stuff together and uh, they go out to dinner and they get wine and that's what a lot of their socialization is around so she was so nervous just to let them know that hey I don't want to be eating and doing food like like oh my god what are we gonna do I mean most of our socialization is around food and I can't help but think that the chemical effects on food um, Lauren mentions wine just saying and how much like even with wine numbs you out I mean I, that was that was like critical for me if I went on dates because at least with the wine it would loosen it up and then maybe I wouldn't be thinking about the food I'd be focused on well I really wouldn't be focused on anything and my date would just be looking better and better but um, maybe it worked out for everybody I don't know but there's a lot of people that don't know how to socialize without food and is it different for men than it's different with women. I don't know, I mean, I have some men on right now, but I definitely think that there's still a stigma. I think there's a stigma that men have it easier, and I don't believe that to be true. And I think there's a stigma for women that it's that we're doomed, and it's just something that we're gonna do, and we always have to be thoughtful around food. So my first challenge for tonight is, what could you do this week that would be different around food? How could you, um, I don't know, have a celebration? What are other ways that you can connect? I mean, back to like the Donna Reed show, everybody sat around the table and ate food together and had dinner together. And that created such an idea around bonding and food. And that's the only time that they would come together. So is that the only time that you talk to people? Is it when you're eating? Because how do you stay present in a sense with your food if you're focused on talking with other people? I mean, you get to talking with people and the next thing you know, your food is gone. And if we were to talk about intuitively connecting with what we're eating, you kind of need your mind to do that. I mean, you don't have to sit there and stare and be like, I'm thinking to yourself, okay, okay. Um, am I still hungry? Did the food kick in? But technically it takes 30 minutes for this part to catch up with this part. So if you've eaten and if you were like me, you gobbled it down so fast, they hadn't even connected. So if you're talking with people or you're too distracted, you don't even notice what you're eating. And before you know it, you're like three cake slices in and then you're just sitting around feeling guilty. And that was always a, a big thing for me, it was not what I was eating, but it was how I was thinking about what I was eating afterwards that just created such a preoccupation. And even later on for me with my wellness and having a different connection with food was about that because in the beginning, a lot of it would be about just thinking about food, thinking about food, and then wondering, should I have eaten it? Should I have not have eaten it? And I mean, really, the only thing that pretty much got done is I'm just shutting all over myself. And I'm going back, oh, what should I eat? Should I not eat? Well, I mean, you ate it. You ate it. And at the end of the day, food is a source of fuel. You're fueling your body and eating what would be good to have eaten. And we can create different connections around it. Becky, I, oh, hi, Becky, um, saying hi in Tennessee. It's good to see you. Um, so what are some of the connections? Maybe you guys can jump in and tell me some of the stigmas or the connections that start with you, but how do you break them? So as to break them is to change up the pattern, to talk to people at different times besides at the table. Um, 
You should be at a, a menu meeting for holiday time with my family. Oh no, I don't think so, Christine. I think I'll skip that one. <laughs> but thanks for the invite. And you know, that's another thing too around food is excusing yourself. And I think too many times we feel obligated or we feel a sense of um, guilt again that we need to do things or we have to show up with all this food. Bring something to someone's house that you want to eat. Don't bring cake if you don't want to eat it. Yeah, that's not going to be helpful. Um, but breaking different patterns, you know, food with music can be fun when you're in the kitchen and making it be a fun time instead of sometimes a place of it being torturous or even slow music or creating it that you have a plan, like you said, meal planning, Christine, but a big component is that it's just having a set plan, almost like when you walk in the kitchen, you're very clear with your intention. I mean, you don't go to work and just, well, maybe some of you do, mindlessly not know what you're gonna do. You just have a plan, you have an intention of what you're gonna do. You wake up in the morning, you know where you're going to work, you know what meetings you have. Maybe you don't have it all sorted out, but there's an intention around it. So it's kind of like walking into your kitchen and whether you have doors or not, it's like, hello, this is my intention before I walk in there. And putting away your phones and different things because phones is gonna create emotional eating. If you're seeing a message and you're seeing a text message, the next thing you know, you're feeling a sense of some kind of alertness or responsiveness and you're gonna munch or eat foods that are good to be have to have been eaten. So meal planning is definitely not the type you're talking about, Christine. <laughs> but meal planning is really a great idea. Making a list, but making the meal plan not in your kitchen, um, because if you're just gonna sit here, you're gonna kind of go in circles. But. I mean, maybe for some of you that's okay. That's just where you want to check in with yourself and ask, what kind of association do you have in your kitchen around food? You, you know, was it a place of um, that, like contention as a kid? Were you one in nine people in a family and to eat meant that you had to just jump in front of everybody and um, have like a brawl to get there to get it done, you know, and how that continues to play out for you. But the again, the same way that you wove in that stuff is the same way that you can get it out, the same way that you can shift those patterns and get it from the root. Um, there's been a lot of stuff on, this is kind of a side note, but informed trauma, there's been some different studies and it talks about how nature versus nurture. And I would be curious to continue to check some of it out because it talks about how you're kind of predisposed to different traumas. So if it is around eating, it starts within utero because with trauma informed studies, like with the ACE, it's starting in utero. So when a baby is in your belly up until when they're four years old, those developmental um, abilities and developmental perceptions have already been created. So if somebody endures a traumatic experience, I get that food is not traumatic for everybody, but if somebody endures that traumatic experience, then they might be predisposed to the way that it's going to handle and the way that it's going to be for them because not every child gets a cookie at five years old and right then and there they have this blissful relationship or they love cookies. Not everybody gets that at five and not everybody is going to automatically associate a reward. In some families, it's just like, you want a cookie? Sure, I'll have a cookie. It tastes good. I'll just have one cookie. It doesn't mean that you're going to be the little girl downing 10 cookies in the process of doing it. So it's to each his own. It's bio-individuality. But the great news is, is as it was created, it can be uncreated. And that's the idea of being soulful and soulfully fueling your body and eating foods because like Lou mentioned, it's just a way of nourishment. And there had been these ideas that it was so much more than what it was. And this month is uh, National Women's Month and tomorrow is National International Women's Day, which is really exciting for me. I feel like we should all like get to like a, you know, in, in celebration of that because it is about us as women. And I think it's cool to acknowledge the strengths that we have because a lot of times when we have different holidays and focuses, we're focusing on what's not working for us. And even now, as we're talking about food, it's to focus on what does work, not what doesn't work. Because could you imagine the laundry list of things that we could all um, put up 
and go through based on what doesn't work for us and all the diets that have failed or all the food plans that have been completely not helpful. Well, think about what has worked and where do you feel peaceful when you're eating and what are the kinds of foods that make you feel um, satiated and make you feel calm. Um, you know, it, like I was talking about the candy given out at the end of soccer, it makes me nutty as well when I see um, people in Europe don't even eat half the foods that we eat. It's like banned, but yet we eat it and we feed it to our children and we don't even know the chemicals and the things that are, we're eating. So if it's growing from the ground, it's going to give us nutrients and make us feel good and create it. and. Also listening to the cues that your body is telling you that you need, I think sometimes we doubt it too much. Now I know somebody could say, oh, well, I don't have such a great relationship with food, so I can't trust myself. Well, I get it. A lot of times though, when the body is craving these sugars and other flowery foods, it's because something is off. It's not, it's not like cool at the root. So getting it back into structure and also taking small little steps. It doesn't have to be this big, gigantic, leap. It can be small little things that just feel doable and as you're doing small little things then you're going to keep adding on to it. So we're going to get ready to close up here shortly. If you have any more questions go ahead and put them down and DM them and again tomorrow's National International Women's, no not National International, International Women's um, Week Day tomorrow and the whole month we're going to focus on women. Next week we're going to talk about confidence versus competency, which is also, I think, a huge portion. And I just see food as being the base of so much what we do because um, you are what you eat. And how do you feel a sense of confidence or confidence if you feel like a big piece of cheesecake? <laughs> or not even if you're thinking about the cheesecake, but the way that it fuels you. And um, I can't push it in enough. I, I honestly, everybody has an inner champion. So whether you're talking about an athlete, whether you're talking about a woman, a man, a child, what you're putting in you is going to fuel you for, you know, being successful. And I do have to brag a little bit. Maybe some of you have heard over the past few weeks, like I even put a post how devastated I was that I got sick because I felt so weak and in, in like unhuman and, and just like a big baby. And it was it was probably stress. And then it's kind of lingered for the past several weeks. And I don't know, I just thought that like you get sick and you just get better. So I could have swore something has to be wrong with me. Well, I got the results today. The doctor told me absolutely nothing is wrong with me. He's never seen such healthy labs in all 37 years. And then I am the healthiest person he has ever met. So that's really exciting news because I was feeling that if there was some type of deficiency in my head, that I was doing something wrong. And that meant that I could have been doing better than I was when I couldn't have done any different. So it was definitely validating and I'm competitive. So not only did I have my labs done, but I did them really good. I got an A plus. I, I was valedictorian today in my lab results. But you know, I think it's almost like I feel better already knowing that now it's for me to heal. And the doctor told me, Dara, it's for you to rest and take it easy. And I'm thinking, well, I don't really know what that means. But for some reason, I, I don't know, I felt a little more compelled that that's what there is for me to do because not just because the doctor said so, but now I know there's nothing innate going on with me and there's nothing wrong with me. There's everything right with me because he said that if I hadn't been so healthy, I probably would have like an IV in my arm and be in the hospital because I wouldn't have been able to tolerate this. I wouldn't have had the, um, you know, the, the resistance to, to battle some of these. I mean, they're just flus and viral and, and icky stuff. So anyway, that's my whole speech about fueling your soul and thinking about what you're eating. I, congratulations, I know, thanks Lou. Yeah, right? Every athlete's got that in them. But you know, we all have it and there's that inner champion and so fueling that and feeling it inside is what's gonna get you to it. So um, please be sure to honor every woman in your life. I'm sure a lot of you do that anyway, every day. And um, 
fuel yourself eating what's good to have been eaten next week come let's chat about confidence versus competency send me any questions that you have and i will catch you guys later thank you to some of you that i see that are just tuning in lucky for you you can watch me on instant replay <laughs> the whole night i'll talk with you guys soon bye